Are you ready for the message? Yeah. We're going to be in Revelation today and the Minor Prophets. It felt like a Revelation Sunday, Little Minor Prophet Sunday. Uh, have you been with us? We're in this series, That's My Church. It keeps going farther and farther than I think it's going to go. We've got a few more weeks of it. The title of today is A Church Alive, A Church Alive. Turn your Bibles to Revelation 3. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Woo! Nothing worse than a dead man preaching to dead people. You ever seen somebody sleepwalk, sleep talk, even worse, sleep laugh? I want to get freaked out. How's somebody sleep laugh? Like, what you laughing about in your sleep right now? What you plotting? You know, like, like I've, I've been around people who sleepwalk. They have the appearance of being awake, but they are not awake. And how, how do we fall asleep as a church? Very simple. You treat casually what Christ treats costly. His bride is a priority to him. It should be a priority to us. That's the church. Worship is an important part of your life. You should be worshiping God. Evangelism, uh, the word of God, the presence of God. These are all things that when we start to treat casually, we become a dead church instead of an alive church. It goes on to say, wake up. Everybody say, wake up. Wake up. Ooh. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I found your deeds unfinished. Unfinished. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, in, my side, uh, of, uh, in my sight, remember therefore what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know when, uh, what time will come to you. Goes on to finish, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And whatever the spirit says to the churches, stop. I uh, love Warren um, Wearsby and Barclay, some of my favorite theologians. And they basically break down three signs of a dead church. The first one is apathy. Apathy. Um, it, bottom line, you just become casual. Like, it's not like you're like, you don't care about God anymore, but you've gotten this rhythm of like, you just kind of care, but you care about other things in the world a little bit more. Uh, the Bible says that the kingdom of God divorces forcefully uh, by people who, who literally are, are fighting with force. The Greek word literally is just a, a, a picture of somebody who is faithful with passion, not somebody who takes their hand off the plow and lives for something else. So you have uh, apathy. Another one is arrogance. My time is too important for the kingdom. My time is too, just bottom line, God, if, if, if Satan can't make you uh, bad, he's going to make you busy. And then last but not least, stuff. The church of Sardis, they were famous for being wealthy. They were like the Bay Area church, basically. Wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. Uh, more wealth than most of the world. Had a lot of stuff. And the reality is, is I think one of the biggest reasons why the church falls asleep and where it is today is because God gives us this one thing to do, and then we just leave it unfinished. He says, your works are unfinished, it says in that. Um, I remember being a young kid and my parents, uh, you know, would leave me in charge. I was the, the oldest boy. My sister had already moved out. I was about 14 years old. And uh, I was uh, the kid who was into fire. I liked magnifying glass things on fire. I liked uh, hairspray that would, like, with a lighter and make it like a torch. I was one of those kids. Like, like you ever have that kid who brings a lighter to school? Stay away from that kid, okay? Um, uh, but I, I just, I, I, was, I was fascinated with it. And so my parents left, and they told me, all you got to do is clean the kitchen. All you got to do is clean the kitchen. Well, my parents leave, and I had this idea. What if I um, took care of spray and doused a bunch of toilet paper like this all the way around the, the bathroom so it would be like a trail of fire, but then I'll have the bathtub filled with water, and it would just die in the bathtub of water. So I, I create this huge hairspray-soaked uh, um, toilet paper all the way to the bathtub. I light it on fire, and I picture it going like this. <sighs> but what happened is I lit it, and it was like... <sighs> Fire just everywhere. I was like, ah! Now, in the bathroom, there were these towels. They're not ordinary towels. Uh, my mom would call them guest towels. I couldn't look at them. I couldn't touch them. I wasn't allowed to smell them. Don't even think about it, Tyler. Those are for the guests. You use the nasty towel. Those are for the important people. So, so there were the guest towels that I never got to touch. Well, they were hanging on the, um, the, the towel rack. And as the fire is going, I remembered that you can douse a fire by smothering it. So I take the guest towels and I smother the fire with the guest towels. Holes in the towels from the fire. What I do is I fold them right back up and hang them straight up again. <laughs> Hopefully mom doesn't notice. My mom and dad come home. My mom comes in the bathroom. She goes, Tyler! And I said, what happened? And I was like, I, I, I started a fire on oh, an accident on purpose. You know? <laughs> and, and then, you know, she's like, what were you doing? And I was like, and then I had to stop the fire with your guest towels. I'm sorry. We can call them now the fire towels. Ha, ha, ha. You know, like all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I get grounded, of course. And then they go to see if the kitchen's done. Kitchen's not done. And again, like, you know, when you tell your kid to go do something, they end up making a Ford. It's kind of cute. But there's one thing they asked me to do was just the kitchen. I didn't do it. Well, God tells us we have one job, one job, become a disciple, make disciples. That's it. When he comes back, he's going to say, did you steward your life the way I called you to steward it? 
Did you live for me? Did you make disciples? Did you live a life fully alive to the, the, the kingdom realities that the kingdom of God could happen now in your life or what is happening in heaven? And the reality is, I hope that all of us would hear this. Well done, good and faithful servant. But some of us, I don't think it's just rebellion. I just think we get distracted and we start doing other things we want to do. Today, I'm here to wake you up to the privilege, to the opportunity to live for the one who created you and the only one that can fulfill you. Are you ready? All right, so how do you preach a message on people coming to life? I looked throughout the Bible. I found the book of Jonah. And some people in the room, you may not know this, but the book of Jonah records the greatest revival ever, ever in the, in the scriptures, ever. It's uh, one city that was saved in three days, a whole city. Jonah walked through it in three days, and the whole city gets saved. It's the greatest revival ever recorded in scriptures. Now, I was at a um, pastoral retreat this last week, and uh, us barrier pastors, we're fascinating to people who pastor in like Idaho and Utah and Texas, they'll come up and be like, what's it like pastoring the Bay Area? What are the people like? And, the, and then they'll ask questions like, is it true if I go to San Francisco right now, I'll just see people just using the bathroom on the sidewalk? Like they ask me all these weird questions they see in the news, you know? They're like, is it true that just people just running into your Nordstrom's and taking, uh, uh, taking out clothes and just running away? Yes, that's true, yeah. <laughs> That's all, yeah, okay. They're like, I think I saw you on the news. Walnut Creek's North. Yeah, that was us on the news. Yep, mm-hmm. that was us. Yep, yep. And so they asked me these questions. And then, so after they're asking all these questions about what it's like to be in the Bay Area at this time, they say, what's your strategy then for the Bay Area? My strategy is very simple. Revival. Yes. Strategy for a broken marriage? Revival. Yes. Strategy for... Uh, for a, a region that is dead, revival. Strategy for the schools, revival. Strategy for you, revival. I'm not trying to argue you into the kingdom. I believe that when your eyes are opened and your ears are opened to the reality of God, you will no longer treat casually what Christ treated costly. That you will start waking up to the realities of God and your life and your God-given birthright. We're going to see how this happens in Jonah. Uh, we're going to look at three parts, and I'm going to pray in just a second. The three parts is this. God sends his word. That's the first thing that God's going to use to, to bring life. Then God's going to send a wind. When we ignore his word, he will send a wind. And last but not least, he sends Jonah. God will send Jonah. He's going to send somebody. Uh, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. God, we need you. We need you. God, first thing we pray for this morning, we pray for Israel. God, we know through your Bible that what's happening in Israel is not political. It is spiritual. So, God, we come against the gates of hell and the enemy of darkness that would try to um, just create uh, division and, and death. And, God, we pray that you would stop that war right now in the name of Jesus. Yes. God, that you would be with those people. God, uh, God, that you would give wisdom uh, right now, Lord. And we say you protect that area. Uh, God, we pray for Hamas, that they would get saved. We pray for Israel, one of the least Christian nations in all the world, that people would get saved also. And God, that you would protect them. We thank you that you adopted us in the family. Oh, we love you, we love you. And last but not least, God, may my words fall to the floor today. God, this is your church. These are your scriptures. May I not mess it up. God, we need you so much. We need you, we need you. And everybody said? Amen. First thing that God does to bring, a, uh, bring alive dead things is he sends his word. Jonah 1 says this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah... Send an Amittai. The word of the Lord, not the word of man, not the word of culture, not the word of politics, not the word of TikTok. No, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. He says, I'll say, the son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. If you want to revive your marriage, get the word of the Lord in your marriage. You want to revive your family, get the word of the Lord in your family. You want to revive a school, get the word of the Lord in a school. When you see the lack of God's word, you'll see an abundance of chaos and death. But when you start to see the word of God come into your life and transform your life, you'll start seeing fruitfulness and restoration and life because the word of God, it says in Psalm uh, 19, one of my favorites, that his instructions are perfect, reviving the soul. Nothing else revives the soul. So so I want to encourage you today, when the word of the Lord comes to you, do not ignore it. Something I loved about the early church is the early church never really talked about the conditions of the world. They talked about who came into this world. And so we're going to talk about the word more than we talk about what's going on in the world. Uh, so why did God send his word? Why did he send his word? Well, the northern kingdom of Israel had been captured uh, by Assyria. Assyria was a, a new world superpower, and they were the, the evilest, darkest, most ruthless nation. Um, if I had time, I'd just uh, uh, teach on the context of who Assyria is, uh, but I don't have time for that. But just picture the worst of the worst. Their capital was Nineveh, and God was calling his prophet to go to straight to the source and to punch in the face with the Holy Spirit. And so Nineveh is the capital. If you want a fun vacation idea for this summer, uh, you can fly to Iraq and you can go see the rubbles in Nineveh. Take some pictures. I'd love to see them, okay? Uh, I'm a travel agent today. Okay, here we go. Um, the Assyrians um, worship the goddess of sex. 
the goddess of sex. This is what they said about the city of Nineveh. It was a city full of blood, a city full of lies, a city full of robbery, a city that enslaved people with witchcraft and prostitution. The Assyrian ruler was named Serendopolis, and he was a perverted man. He believed your life's purpose was to fornicate. Public would say the reason why your life is to fornicate. He had hundreds and hundreds and thousands of female concubines and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of male concubines. And what happened with Serendopolis is he literally ended up going crazy and he lost his mind. He decided to set himself on fire with his favorite male lover and his favorite female lover. Can I just tell you what the world says is progress, the word says is decay. When the world comes up with a new idea of this is the way you live your life, be very, very careful. It does not line with the word of God. It is not progress. I believe in the right type of progress. Can I tell you this way? You don't need more things in your life. You need the right things in your life. You don't need more stuff. You don't need more ideologies. You need the right word of God, the right type of people, the right church, the right pastor, the right small group. You get the right things in your life instead of more things. Watch what happens to your life. But when you have the wrong things, you are going to lose your mind. And Serendopolis lost his mind. So how did they get here? How did they get here? Everything looks like it's over for Israel, for Nineveh, for Assyria. Darkness looks like it has won. Wickedness looks like it's won. Depravity looks like it has won. Assyria is dark. You think the Bay Area is bad? Assyria would say to the Bay Area, hold my beer. <laughs> they would top. Darkness has been around since the beginning of time. It says in the Bible, do not, do not yearn for the good old days because this is not wise. Because when we, we yearn for the good old days, we actually make them better than they were. We actually don't see the holistic thing that was happening then. Darkness was back then also. Darkness is manifesting differently now. And, and, and the reality is, is that we, we live in a time where depravity looked like it's one. In the Bay Area, wickedness has looked like it's one. Bad ideology has looked like it's one. Uh, uh, it's like, um, you ever been to like a, a Warriors game and the Warriors are down 15 and there's five minutes left in the game, you're like, man, I think we should leave because I don't want to get caught up in traffic. So you're that fan that leaves the game early, and like, everybody's like, where are you going? It's like, man, I'm trying to hit that traffic. They're down 15. They're going to lose. It's all good. It looks like the other team has won. It's like being at a Giants game in the seventh inning, and they're down five runs. You're like, let's just get out of here. You leave in the seventh inning. Uh, it'd be like being at the Oakland A's game, like every game, and you just leave in the fifth <laughs> inning. It's, it's just, it's just, it's too easy to make fun of the A's. I, I give myself an allowance, one every two months. I'm a Mariners fan. I've never even been in the World Series. So, so I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm more an A's fan than anything else when it comes to, like, uh, the, the, the pain of what it's like to be an A's fan. Anyways, 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 anyways. And the reality, I, I, uh, I'm a big fan. Like, man, if there's still time on the clock, I'm not turning the TV off. Well, a few weeks ago, uh, I'm a big Colorado fan right now. Uh, they're one of my favorite teams to watch. Uh, come on now. Shout out to Colorado. Let's go. Um, I love Coach Prime. I mean, this guy is like on the, on the, um, uh, at the press conference just preaching the gospel. You know, he's like, he's like aren't you worried if you may fail? He's like, you can't break me because you didn't make me. I got a Savior. His name's Jesus. I'm like, woo. Okay. I'm like, okay, Dion. Okay, okay. I mean, he's saying this every week. And I, I mean, I love, I love Coach Prime so much. I ordered the, the Prime glasses, the blender ones. The, the, I just got an email yesterday. They're on the way. I got the big old gold ones. I might preach on them one Sunday. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, but there, there, there are so many prayers that were um, ordered. I'm not getting mine until December 1st, but I'm, I'm believing my faith. They're on the way. Um, so Rachel and I, Saturday night, were watching the Colorado-Colorado State game, and um, Colorado was losing by more than uh, uh, 10 points, and it was a, a fourth quarter, and and it was like 10 o'clock. I was like, okay, we need to, you know, wind down, relax. Let's watch some. Rachel's like, let's watch some a little more chill. I was like, yeah, we should watch some more chill. This game's over. And uh, so we put on Anchorman um, because that's, that's chill. I'm Ron Burgundy. Uh, so um, uh, so we, we start watching Anchorman. I look at my phone just in case, you know, they come back. And I see with one minute, they're down to eight. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's over, Rachel. We're good. We don't have to turn back on. And so I come to church the next day. And Joe's like, man, wasn't that game crazy last night? I was like, yeah, I'm not, it's too bad they lost. You know, Travis Hunter, like him getting thrown out of the game, he's their best player. You know, that was a dirty play. And Joe's like, they didn't lose, they won. And I was like, what? <laughs> he's like, bro, like overtime was like one of the greatest games ever. I was like, what? And like Rachel, I was like, Rachel, we turned the game, they, they won. She's like, I know I saw on Twitter, I didn't want to tell you. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you. You know, and I was like, I was like, ah. Catch this real quick. To everybody who's live streaming, especially, if you have fled out of California in the fourth quarter, I'm going to invite you back because there is a comeback a coming. Because the reality is you're going to hear things like, guess what happened in the Bay Area? Thousands, millions say, what? 
The Bay Area, oh, it's, it's one of the greatest places to live. No more looting, no more stealing. Man, it's the greatest people. And you go, what? You're gonna say, I left too early. I turned it off too early. I fled too early. If there's breath in our lungs and a remnant of God's people, there is still a chance for a great revival. And I'm gonna take that chance in the Bay Area. Now, if I could just encourage you today, I, um, yeah, well, okay, I'm pause. Nope, not gonna do it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, how do we get here? 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 Um, I almost jumped to the very end. I was, I was getting, you, you guys were responding while I was like, oh, no. <laughs> message over. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, so how, how do we get here? How do we get here? What, what happened uh, to God's people that they were so susceptible to being uh, uh, conquered, so susceptible uh, to being uh, pulled into captivity? Here's what happened. King Solomon had died. Their leader had died. And so they fell into chaos. Idol worship became prevalent. Infighting became the thing. Division. Ten tribes to the north separated from two tribes to the south. And it is a tale as old as time. The enemy knows if he can divide and conquer that the people he divides will fight themselves and he won't even have to do the fighting anymore. You know what's funny about division? It never presents itself as division. When it comes to church, it doesn't go, hey, division's here. No, it comes in with the title of preference. It comes in with the title of pride. It comes with the title of bitterness. And I, I mean, I just got to talk about 2020 real quick. I don't really enjoy talking about 2020. Uh, it was one of my least favorite years. It was, it, was a, it was a tough season for a lot of people I love and, and just what even happened with the church at that time. But I feel like Satan called an all hands on deck demon principality hell meeting. He's like, on Zoom, everybody meet. It's me, Satan. We're going to talk about how we're going to attack the church and America. And so all the Satan's uh, army, you know, zooms in and because uh, they cannot be uh, omniscient or omnipresent. That is not, that is not uh, uh, Satan. Our God is omniscient. He's everywhere at once. And so, so I just picture him zooming in and saying, all right, here's what we're doing this, this next season in America and in the church. The aim is the vision. I picture, you know, the demons asking, well, like, where at? Family barbecues, divide them. What about Christmas parties? Divide them. What about church services? Divide them. What about a Starbucks uh, a coffee? Divide them. Well, how will we divide them? And let's just be honest. It doesn't take spiritual eyes to see this. It takes natural eyes even to see this. This is the most divided I've ever seen our nation. So many little levers that if I just said one thing, you gone. If I said one thing that I maybe process that you don't process, you're like, I, I can't believe it. I'm out of here. I mean, division is in the DNA of our nation and the church right now, and it's got to get out. So, so I just picture them going, so how would we divide them? What are we going to use? How will we destroy them? How are we going to divide them? And I just picture Satan just going, just use one of these. <laughs> just a little bit of cloth. People at barbecues are going to go nuts over these. <laughs> the ones that aren't wearing them are going to judge the ones wearing them, and the ones wearing them are going to judge the ones not wearing them. Oh, I'm going to blow up barbecues this summer. Oh, I'm going to blow up churches over a little. Are they a mask-wearing church or a non-mask-wearing church? People were moving to na uh, uh, different states because of this. And I'm telling you, if you do not keep the main things the main things, another one of these will come along. And it will be so silly why you leave a church. I've seen people leave a church over the type of chairs, over the music, over this, over that. I had a pastor tell me they had people leave the, the, the church because of the color of the carpet. Oh, it's devastating when the church gets divided over these sideways energy things. But our church is not called Preference Church. It's called Mission Church because preference divides and mission unites. I guarantee you, you're going to come to church and say, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. I hate the bathroom. So do I. I hate them so much. I'm telling you, when we get our first building and our, our, our own church home, we buy it, we're going to have the nicest bathrooms. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to declare things. Heated toilet seats for everyone. Come on. Come on. Now, I don't know how we're going to have them heated. Maybe it's like you just, if someone uses the bathroom, you use it right after them so it's kind of warm. I don't care how we do it, but we're going to do it. Oh. That's a terrible joke. That's potty humor. Like, literally, it's potty humor. It's like just uh, too easy, too easy. And right now, you're probably upset. Stop getting divided over a joke. Oh, I, I, I set you up. I set you up. I'm not going to that church. They talked about bathroom jokes. That's why you leave. That's why somebody would leave. Like, literally, this is what happens in the church is, is we get so worked up over things. The thing that should fire you up 
is that there is a God who died on the cross and emptied the grave for you. That should, that should make you come to life. And then what else should make you come to life is that outside of these walls, people are dying and losing their way and you are the one called because God sent his word to you just like Jonah. So that's how they got here, division. We're not gonna be a divided church. I have three things I wrote down to vision. Preference is one. The next one is pride. You know, you know what's sad about the pride one? Is prideful people don't know they're prideful. Pharisees don't know they're Pharisees. The ones that are the policemen for the church that think they know the Bible better than everybody else. And they tell you, oh, this is what it means. And this is what, I mean, they're so dogmatic. They, they figured out all 66 books written by over 40 authors. Even though theologians still disagree on, you know, I'll, I'll use one that divides the church like crazy. Women in ministry theologians literally go back and forth on what it looks like. You know, theologians show that, that women did all five full things in the, in the church. They taught, uh, they evangelized, Priscilla, everything they led, they did everything. You can find all five in the Bible. And then there's this one verse in Timothy that says that women uh, must be silent in church. God is forbidding something there, but is he forbidding women can never ever preach in church? I don't see that in scripture. And, and so I'm, I'm just gonna tell you real quick, you go down that line real quick, theologians for thousands of years have argued over that. But then you get Pharisees who think they actually know the answer and they'll leave churches over it. I'm telling you, like, when we get to heaven and I'm wrong, I'll repent to God. But the main things are the main things in our house. And the plain things will be the plain things. I, mean, I could go Calvinism. I could, I could, give me, I could just, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do something. Let's, let's go back to the message. Okay. Anyways. Um, so God sends his word because there is decay. And the only thing that revives decay is his word. The world's, the world's ideas, the world's passion and zeal for what's going on right now will not revive this area. I'm telling you, the word of God is what will revive it. But if you will not respond to it, part two is God will send his wind to you to wake you up. God, so God sends his word. And what happens uh, when he sends his word? This is what Jonah does when the word of the Lord comes to him. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed uh, for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he had found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So this mighty minor prophet, the word of the Lord comes to him and this is what he's supposed to do. But guess what he does? He runs from God. And we can all relate with that. All of us have heard God tell us to do something and we run the opposite direction of it. So for us to look at part two, the, the wind. So, so the problem, we, we, we've talked about the problem. There's decay, there is chaos, there is division, but in our house, we're not gonna have that. So what is the solution to the problem? Well, I'll tell you what the solution isn't. The solution isn't comfort. The solution isn't comfort. Right here, Jonah ran away from the Lord to Tarshish. What does Tarshish represent? It represents a comfortable city that uh, lines up with his politics more than somewhere else. We don't have Tarshish in America, but we do have Texas and Tennessee and Idaho and Utah. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm going to preach. If you're, if you're from there, don't turn off. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. Don't, hey, 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 Utah, stay online. Okay, hey, 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 Tennessee, stay online. Okay. Um, uh, what I mean by that is geographically, if you fled a place because you just didn't like it and you're annoyed of it, God, God never moves mightily when people flee. Bunker theology is not in the Bible. If we forfeit cities like this to the enemy, we have lost our mandate and mission and why there is breath in our lungs. Now, if you're somebody who's like, man, I just feel called to Tennessee. I hear they only have 80% Christian. I want to get that last 20%. Go to Tennessee. <laughs> but if you want to stay in the Bay Area where there's 4% Christian and 96% lost, and you're saying, I want to stay here and proclaim the gospel, then stay here. Because Tarshish represents chasing comfort. And let's be honest, that's what our flesh wants. Not only is it a geographic thing, it's a spirit thing. You'd be like, whoa, I didn't move. Pastor Tyler is proud of me. That was a great day. My pastor's proud of me. Well, guess what? Tarshish is also a spiritual condition. You can bunker up here even in the Bay Area. Come to church, go, uh, you know, listen to the message, and then leave. Uh, get in a small group, but never, ever want to be around the world. Make sure your whole family's away from the world. And so you're bunkering up away from the world. But that is you seeking comfort inside a, uh, of the church instead of actually being used to be the church. What good is a lamp if we hide it under a bowl? Come on now, do not hide your life under a bowl. Live for God. Uh, proclaim the name of God. So the, one of the first things the solution isn't is comfort. So he seeks comfort. But when he seeks comfort, God will intervene with the wind. Let's look what happens. Then the Lord sent a great wind, a great wind. This may stretch your theology a little bit, but <laughs> Satan didn't send the wind. Climate change didn't send the wind. No, God sent the wind. And if a word will not wake you up, a storm usually does. And so he sends a storm to Jonah's life. And such violent storm arose uh, that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea uh, to lighten the ship. 
But Jonah had gone below deck where he had laid down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe you will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Stop. Everybody in the Bay Area is religious. Everybody, atheists, Democrats, Republicans, they're all religious about something. They're all worshiping something. And in this picture, you have the pagans calling out to their idol more passionately than the man of God is. He's sleeping in the boat. And I'm going to ask you the same question the captain asked him. How can you sleep at a time like this? How can you sleep? Battle lines are being drawn. In World War II, there was this prime minister named Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain literally thought that they were in a peacetime. There's nothing worse than when a leader thinks they're in peacetime when they're actually in wartime. So Hitler is taking country after country after country. And in 1933, Winston Churchill started saying, hey, he's coming for us. It's not going to stop at France. And, and he wrote Neville Chamberlain this. He goes, you're leading our people to believe that we are in a peacetime. You're leading them to believe to live in a fool's paradise. A fool's paradise thinking that war is not coming. And he tells Neville Chamberlain, when you go to have a treaty with Hitler, you can pick war or you can pick dishonor. Neville Chamberlain came back and he picked dishonor. And the reality is, is that when we say yes to Jesus, you're not saying yes to a peacetime here on earth. You're saying yes to peace in your soul, but you're saying yes to a war in the Bay Area. You can either bow to culture or bow to the cross. You can either bow to, bow to Jesus or you can bow to man's ideology. You cannot bow to both. And my prayer to you is that you'd realize I would be a terrible shepherd to make you think that you can live in peace in this type of area or this type of climate of the world. That would be a fool's paradise. Some of you think like, well, if I just don't bother Satan and I just kind of do my own thing, then he's going to think I'm good over here. Satan does not draw treaty lines with anybody. He's coming for your family, for your marriage, for your kids, and only the people that are prepared to pray against it and bind those things and live the way God called them to live, they're the ones that are going to find victory in the war. You're not going to find peace by hiding under a bush. Amen? Amen. So, so he says, how can you sleep? We're in a storm. We're in a battle. He goes on. It says this, the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible. Uh, they cast lots, and a lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? For what people are, are, are you from? It's interesting. At first, when he got on the ship, he's like, I'm just like you guys. I'm a Syrian. He's like, undercover Christian. Hey, hey, just like you guys. You know, Hey, what's up? What's up? I'm all good. And then a storm comes. It's amazing what a storm does in our life. The, the only reason God would allow a storm in your life is not to punish you, but it's to free you. And this storm that comes in Jonah's life, it frees him. It frees him from every identity he's tried to grab onto that he's not. Every other thing he's, you will never ever have peace in your soul until you're living in the center of God's will. And so the storm comes to shake off his false identity, his false idea of life, his false comfort, and it shakes him off. And it's like this awakening moment. He says this, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. There's something about when a storm comes in your life and it wakes you up and says, I'm a son, I'm a daughter of the living God called by name to reach people in this area. A storm will do that to your life. And I love this next part. This is, this is where it gets really good. This terrified them and they asked, what, what should we do? They knew he was running away from the Lord. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? He says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. No other option, just pick me up, throw me in the sea. And if I could just, if you could just see the picture of Scripture trying to show us, he's saying, I'm done going the wrong way of compromise. I'd rather be in the sea of obedience than the boat of compromise. I'd rather be in the center of my God's will in a storm than in a boat where it's taking me to death, even though I feel comfortable on it. Throw me into the sea. Throw me into the sea of obedience. It makes me think of our, our, of our Savior when he's on this earth and he's telling his disciples, hey, don't say one month from now. Don't say four months from now. The harvest is now. And he says, ask your creator to throw you into the harvest, to throw you in your obedient calling. No longer will you sit on the sidelines. God wants to throw you out into the sea of obedience. There's no better place for you to live. No more fulfilling. There is no safer place than the sea of obedience. So he says, throw me out and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Stop. It is my fault. It is my fault. I just got to give you a heads up real quick. When judgment comes to this world, it first starts in the church, not the world. And Jonah's saying, it's my fault. It's my fault. The Bay Area, we want to blame 
a, a mayor, a, a governor, a, a city official want to blame a president. The reason why things are today the way they are is because the salt that was supposed to hold things together lost its saltiness. Because the light that was supposed to illuminate the truth and the beauty of God hid under a lamp. Jonah's saying, it's my fault. And again, I, if I could just say it, in a culture that is as dark as ours is, and we see that this last year was the highest suicide rate ever in America, that people are losing people uh, that they love. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dark time. Depression is all-time high. I, I got to say this to you. How can you sleep? If culture hasn't waken you up, you just might be one of those people who are half dead. You're like, Ty, you just said that. I know I said it. I, I, was, I was raised, can, I, can I do the half dead uh, part of my message? Do you think that'd be too hard? And I really believe this if for you and for myself. When the church starts to live downstream, because culture is downstream, church is upstream. And, and when we start to sit in the boat and just allow the culture to drive us and we start to compromise, that's when it's over. That's when the spirit of the house is it's done. And so, so, so one of the first uh, solutions isn't comfort, but the other solution isn't compromise. We're not going to be a church that compromises. We're going to understand that we have a responsibility. We're not going to compromise our schedule. We're not going to compromise truth. We're not going to compromise our passion. We're not going to compromise our character. We're going to live a way that God's called us to live. So I want to talk about compromise real quick. So when the church decides to compromise uh, a truth or something like that, it gets broken in the church, but it creates destruction out in the streets. Um, one of the things that I just want to encourage you real quick, if there is something in the Bible that you disagree with, you're wrong. Okay. Uh, you're like, oh, hold on, I'm, I'm pretty smart, Tyler. I'm pretty smart. No, 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 like if it's between you and the Lord, trust me, you're wrong. And, 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 and there are things that I wrestle, I, I wrestle with scripture at times. I wrestle with it, but I, I allow it to pin me. I allow it to, to defeat me in, in all the right ways. And, and, and the Bible shares very, very, very simply that, that, that truth is a spirit. It's not a thing, it's a spirit. And so if you, if you compromise truth, you've literally said, spirit, you can leave. And so we're not going to compromise truth at all in this house. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna love people. We're going to share the truth and love. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, I'm not going to be the pastor that from the platform goes, this is what we believe, and this is why we believe it, and I'm going to stop my foot, and then half the place will go, yeah, preach, preach hard truth, pastor. Like, that's not how I'm going to do that here. Now, what we do need to do is what Ephesians says, how the church should operate. We share the truth in love. And this is where I'm talking about where I really want you to come to life. So... Um, I'll share a quick illustration that will, will, will help you understand this. Um, so when I was in L.A., uh, it was when the Jonas Brothers were, like, really big the first time around, and I was a youth pastor. I hated the Jonas Brothers. I couldn't stand them. I wasn't a Jonas Brothers guy. I was an NSYNC guy. I loved me some NSYNC. You know what I'm saying? Pow, pow, pow. Okay. okay. I'm not, I'm not going to do all of it, but I, okay. but, 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 but I, I, was, all, I was all about the NSYNC, okay? So, so, so I was NSYNC, not Jonas Brothers. And so... So all my youth kids love the Jones Brothers. They came to our church for a while in L.A., and then they, you know, walked away from the Lord. And I just couldn't stand them. I just thought they were, like, the, the worst band ever. Uh, all my youth kids, I'm like, the girl, like, oh, I have a crush on this. I'm like, that guy's a loser. Have a crush on somebody better, you know? Like Justin Timberlake. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so, uh, so they were at a Dodgers game one time, and they got booed by the whole stadium. And I was like, yeah, boo, you suck. Like, like uh, we, we would always bring our kids to a, a couple of Dodgers games. You get the Dodger dog section in the right field. And so I, would, I was like, oh, man, I missed that game. I would have booed them so hard. You know, this is me before I'm sanctified, okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so I was not a fan at all. And Rachel and I, it was about 2018, 19. We like watching almost any documentary. And we found a documentary. It was on the Jones Brothers. And I was like, man, eh, let's watch it. Let's see, I want to see, you know. And so uh, shares them growing up in church, their dad being a pastor. And... Uh, their dad served in the church faithfully for, gosh, 20-plus years, had a parsonage. They come out with their first album, and because it wasn't a Christian album, they booted their dad out of the church, fired him. And they go to the house where they grew up in, but it's no longer the house because their, their first album is what made their dad lose everything. And it was a legalistic church, and, and, and so they have these wounds from the church, and then you find out they have this, you know, these things they went through as a family and why they broke up, and they're coming back together, and they're realizing how important family is. And at the end of the documentary, I remember telling Rachel, like, I love the Jonas Brothers. I want to go to a Jonas Brothers concert one of these days. Like, you know, we started listening to the car, you know. Uh, and I was, like, I was like, yeah, I love the Jonas Brothers. And, and it made me think about this. Before you try to tell somebody hard truth, know their story. Know their documentary. For us to bring people to where we, we know where they need to be, we need to know where, where they've been. So good. And so we start with loving people like crazy. We do not compromise uh, our love. We love like crazy. We are generous. We are kind. And let me just put it this way. You know too much to live the way you're living right now. 
You know too much to worship the way you worship sometimes. You know too much to serve the way you're serving right now. You know too much to not be sharing the, the, the love of God. You know too much. And that's why Jonah's saying, it's my fault. I know too much. I know my calling. I know how I'm supposed to operate. Throw me in the sea of obedience because I want to be used by my God now. And some of you, you may have been in Jonah 1 where the word of the Lord just came to you. Congratulations, you got saved this past season. Some of you, you're in Jonah 2 right now. You are running away. You're in the boat of compromise, the boat of comfort. And today's your day saying, I'm jumping the sea of obedience and I'm gonna live the way I'm supposed to live. And then some of you, you've been waiting for this last part. You're like, Tyler, I've been waiting for you to say this last part because I, I wanna live for Jesus. I wanna proclaim the word of God. It's God sends Jonah to revive a city. God sends Jonah to revive a city. So part three, it's this beautiful thing that we see. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I just love that our God's a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. Jonah totally rebelled, was about to forfeit his birthright, his calling, but God was so persistent with him. So he calls him a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So you, right here, you'll see what, what creates revival for somebody. First is the word of the Lord, but the second one, you're gonna see obedience. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. Some of you, you have been just been held back because you will not obey the word of the Lord. If you want your soul to be revived, you want to be used to revive a region, you have to hear the word of the Lord, but then you must obey the word of the Lord. He obeys the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city and took three days to go through it. Jonah began going uh, uh, a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So now you have the word of the Lord uh, uh, preached to you, then you obey the word, and then he proclaims the word. Those are the three right there. You receive the word, you obey the word, and you start proclaiming the word. There's revival right there in three little steps. Uh, and, and then this is what I love. This is all he says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. What he is proclaiming is, repent, you're going to death, come to life. Now, Jonah obviously did not go to Bible college and go to a preaching class because this is the worst sermon I've ever read. There is no funny stories. There is no three points. There is no expository preaching. There is no context or anything. It is a man of, of the Lord preaching one thing, repent. I invite you back to abundant life. Turn around. You're going to death. Come to life. And for three days, he walks through a city, and he proclaims one thing, an invitation back to life. You're going to death. Come to life. Can I tell you, your responsibility in the Bay Area is not trying to talk somebody and saying yes to Jesus. Your responsibility is just to invite people back to life, to invite them back to abundance, to invite them back to redemption. And so for three days, he preaches the world's worst message, but has the greatest return we've ever seen in the Bible. Yeah. Paul says, I didn't come with great stories. I came with the power of Christ to share the gospel. You don't need to become a great communicator of the gospel. You just need to care enough to share the gospel. And so he shares it. And after three days, the whole city repents. They put on sackcloth. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. The Nehemiahs believed a, a God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. A fast was proclaimed. Uh, we uh, finished our uh, first three days of prayer and fasting to start the month. And I felt in my spirit that we were supposed to uh, do it this week again. Because I think that some of you missed your opportunity this last week to fast and pray. And I'm telling you, when you start to fast and pray in your life, there are, there's a different type of spiritual return the Bible shows. I've taught on already, go to prayer and fast. I don't have time to teach on right now. But there is a different, you, have you ever put a Mentos in like a Diet Coke or Coke bottle and just see it explode? You know what I'm talking about? That's what happens when you put prayer and fasting together. It is literally just the, it is the, 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 the explosive spiritual cocktail that brings a different type of thing in your life and in the church. And so there was repentance, and the repentance led to fasting. Why did they fast? Because they are declaring, my flesh has been in charge. This city taught me that, that pleasure and lying and living for myself was the right route. Well, now I'm saying no to self, and I'm saying yes to God. So I want to encourage you this week, Wednesday through Friday, man, fast with us again. We're, I'm fasting back-to-back -back weeks for you, okay? You think I, like, I, I love pizza. I'm giving it up for you to fast again. I want to invite you to team prayer Wednesday at 9.30. It's powerful. We're going to pray. We're kicking out the fast again on Wednesday. But we're going to fast and declare our flesh is no longer in charge. We will be spirit-led people, not flesh-led people. Yes. And the repentance is put on the sackcloth. It's very simple. It's taken off all the robes the world had you put on. It says this, that when the king arose from the throne, he took off his royal robes and covered himself with sackcloth. It's a very significant picture because all of us, you came into church wearing some royal robe that you've acquired from this world. The robe of success, the robe of good looks, the robe of money, the robe of performance. And today, that robe that you think is so beautiful, it's actually been weighing you down and stealing you, stealing from you. Today's your day, you gotta throw that robe off 
and you get to put on the sackcloth of mourning saying, God, I actually want the robe that you paid for. I want the robe of righteousness. No longer will I clothe myself. No longer will I try to present a, a, a fake self. God, I want to see the real me that is only created through the real you. So how do we do that? How do we do it? How do we wake up? How do we, how do we walk out of here? What's, how, do you res, how do you respond to this type of message? You know, do you stand up? I'm alive. You know, I'm awake. You did it, Tyler. I'm, I'm down. I, I want to live for God. I think one of the greatest ways you can respond to a message like this is receive communion. Receive the promises of your birthright. I, w- I want to read you a very simple um, thing I got from my studies this week. It's a story about America's greatest miser. Her name was Hetty Green. She had gone down in history, history as America's greatest miser. Yet when she died in 1916, Hetty Green left an estate valued over $100 million in 1916. She ate cold oatmeal because it cost too much to heat it up. Her son had suffered a leg amputation because she delayed so long in looking for a free clinic that his case became incurable. She was wealthy, yet she chose to live like a pauper. Eccentric, certainly. Crazy, perhaps. But nobody could prove it. She was so foolish that she hastened her own death by bringing on an attack of apocalypse while arguing about the value of drinking skim milk. But Hedy Green is an illustration of too many Christian believers today. They have limitless wealth at their disposal, and yet they live like paupers. It was this kind of Christian that Paul would write his epistles to over and over again. Paul's letters over and over again. Wake up. Wake up. Alarm clock moment. Wake up. And and I've never met an alarm clock I like. Like, like, I mean, every, every iPhone sound is like, wow, wow. You know, it's like, it's like, like, it sounds like the Russians are invading when I wake up. I mean, like, okay, I'm on, I'm on it. You know, like, it's, a, it's like, is, are we at war? The only alarm clock I've ever met that I love is communion. It's this beautiful, I mean, it's this beautiful picture of God saying, hey, I want you to remember what all this means so you'll never fall asleep to what it represents. And so the, 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 the cup that represents my blood, it is me reminding you, do not become casual about what is costly. I paid a price for you. You are a blood-bought and sons and daughters. You are now a prince and princess. You are now forgiven. You are now whiter than snow. Stop looking like your life is a life of shame. No, your life is a life of conquering now. So when you receive the cup, receive everything that comes with that birthright. And then the bread. The bread is, represents his broken body. It's an alarm clock. Hey, brokenness, it can stop today. I can heal you today. I can restore you today. And so when you receive the bread today, we're going to pray for healing today. We're not going to be a church that just sings for a house of miracles. We're going to declare and pray for a house of miracles. And so here's how we're going to receive communion. Stand up. We're not going to be in a cozy position. Uh, If you need healing today, I just want you to raise your hand. The people around you, they're going to pray for you. And in just a second, go ahead and raise it up real quick just so people know who they are. Okay, we've got hands all over. Make sure you get a hand on this person, just a shoulder. Don't make it weird. This is one of our God-given birthrights in communion, that we would be healed. Some of you, when you receive communion, you just need to confess a sin today to your God. You need to confess a sin of a rhythm that you know you shouldn't be living, apathy, whatever it is. You're gonna confess it and you're gonna receive your birthright and you're gonna wake up to your calling. The two things I declare today for your life is you're gonna walk out of a bad rhythm today and walk into a godly rhythm. Some of you are gonna walk in here broken, you're gonna walk out whole now today. And the reason why is because the blood and the bread represent the greatest inheritance ever. The kingdom of heaven is ours now. It's ours now. What is in heaven is happening on earth now. So God, we submit uh, submit to you right now. God, the promises that are yes and amen. God, I pray right now for every person that raised their hand to be healed. God, we pray right now by the power of your spirit, not by might, not by strength, but by your spirit, they would be healed. God, we pray for great testimonies. God, you shows that when great expectation, there is great impartation. So God, would you impart healing right now? Would you impart wholeness right now? God, we ask that you would heal broken bodies, that you would heal sickness, that you would heal depression, that you would heal a doctor's letter that says this and it's impossible. God, would you do the possible for the impossible? And God, we confess today our sin. God, we repent today of being cavalier about the things of the kingdom. Oh God, we need you. We need you. We need you. And everybody said...